Hello everyone, it's Monday, it's the 23rd of November, I got that right today, on Thursday I kept saying it was the 20th when it was the 19th, but I did know that it was Thursday, which is a not bad going, but today I'm sure it's Monday and I'm sure of the date, and today I'm feeling really tired, I don't know why, I've been sleeping alright, I didn't uh, do anything physically crazy last week, I um, had a quietish weekend, but I'm just, I'm just tired. My body feels tired, my, my mind feels tired, I just feel tired. I am very grateful to have a bit of time and space to, to not expect too much of myself today, and I hope that if the same is true for you on the days when you just really find it hard to get going, that, uh, that you have that space too. I decided on Friday already what I was going to talk about today, and um, it might seem like a bit of a cheat, but I want to read something to you, which I read on Friday, and which just completely cheered me up and made me feel really positive. Just, I just found myself agreeing with massively. In The Guardian Online on Friday, Gabby Hinsliff, um, a journalist, she, she wrote an article on, in, their opinion, in the opinion column on hobbies. But I think it extends far beyond hobbies. And she titled it, Give me a cheerful amateur like Bill Bailey over a joyful perfectionist any day. So there's an obvious reference there to the UK uh, TV program Strictly Come Dancing. And there's a bit of uh, Great British Bake Off in the article as well. And it's part sort of about hobbies, but it's about so much more. And I want to read it for you. There are few things more overrated in life than being good at it. Talent will out, obviously, and winning is always nice. But nobody loves a joyless perfectionist who smugly gets everything right first time. It's why Bill Bailey absolutely deserves to be the unexpected breakout star of this year's Strictly Come Dancing, even if, whisper it, he isn't technically the most proficient dancer. And why the Great British Bake Off just hasn't been the same since the eye-rolling Lottie was kicked off. Sarcastic, erratic, occasionally inspired and occasionally scraping melted icing off the counter with a sigh. She was the mildly disruptive, the perfect mildly disruptive contestant for our wholly disrupted year. The series isn't really about baking, or even about the journey, a mawkish but artfully choreographed backstory that helps contestants tug at the heartstrings. It's more to do with the unexpected joy of doing things, by which I mean, of course, things that don't actually matter cheerfully but not at all well not all that well for a happy few the idea that you don't actually have to be any good at a hobby to carry on bashing away at it is old news they're the ones behind the rise of so-called tuneless choirs or singing groups for people who can't hit a note to save their lives but thoroughly enjoy belting out a song anyway people who would be too intimidated to join a proper choir and be the only one singing off key but who found a way of letting rip without being made to feel self-conscious. They're also the driving force behind Parkrun, which, like Joe Wicks's online PE lessons, has been an absolute gift to those of us always picked last for netball. Sure, you can turn up in an athletics vest and take a Saturday 5K around the park unbelievably seriously if you want to, killing yourself to meet last week's personal best and bragging about it afterwards on Facebook. But you can, or could, before social distancing put a stop to it. Also walk a bit and run a bit, and walk a bit more before going to the cafe for a cake. You could bring the kids or the dog, and still raise a chorus of supportive whips and cheers as you stagger over the finish line last. It is, as they always said at school, but never really meant, the taking part that counts. The whole thing reminds me fondly of our old annual five-kilometer village fun run, which was so uncompetitive that people did it with pushchairs or in flip-flops, and actually winning was considered a shade too try-hard. In a relentlessly goal-oriented world, where even hobbies seem to come with performance targets attached, there's something very relaxing about being publicly and unashamedly rubbish at something. It's not about being unafraid to fail. The American philosophy of seeing mistakes as a necessary step in any learning process. So much as realizing that in more human endeavors than we care to admit, failure itself is a fundamentally silly concept. Not everything has to be a race, a competition, your own private hunger games. My own minor lockdown breakthrough was realizing that yoga isn't actually meant to be a competitive sport. It's not about hovering miserably at the back of classes full of yummy mummies who can effortlessly do the splits, but about unrolling a mat somewhere quiet and being content just to stretch out whatever will comfortably stretch. The one saving grace of being once again confined to barracks now 
is that nobody outside can judge your faltering efforts to do a headstand, or indeed to come up with wildly exciting yet educational activities to entertain the children through the longest, dullest winter on record. And if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it, then who is to say that the, whether the lumberjack is any good or not? For anyone who struggles with nagging inner demons, meanwhile, there's something comforting at the end of an exhausting year about the message that just doing your best, or even your half-assed second best, will do. This year of all years, I'd have happily watched some mindless reality telly that didn't actually have the heart to kick anyone off, but instead just let all the contestants stay to the end, falling ever more magnificently short at the weeks as the weeks wore on and the pastry challenges grew more got more preposterous. Life doesn't have to be one long, dispiriting process of realizing that you're never going to excel at something, and should therefore probably drop out with your dignity intact. It should be fine to dabble, to amble, to be gloriously and relentlessly average at something, to do with no particular end in sight except the killing of an afternoon. Winning at life, or striving to, can never become a substitute for actually living it. That's it for today. That's what I wanted to share with you. It spoke to me. Um, it spoke to me as I, as I, this morning, as I, as I need to put things down, I need to have, um, I need to fail at today in the expectations I have of myself as a human being, as a minister, as a husband, as a father, maybe. The, the way that I think today should go is probably not the way that it's going to, because I need to rest. I have a couple of conversations I must have, I've got some work I will do, but today I need to fail at being my best self. And that's okay. And it's taken me a long time in my life to come to the point where that is almost always okay. Where I can accept that and say that that is in fact gift to me and maybe gift to the people who share my life because of the way that I look after myself and the way that I, 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 I don't succumb to the irritation that disappointing myself brings. Whatever you want to do today however well or poorly you do it, whatever you decide just not to do because you don't feel like it. I hope that there's permission in you, I hope that there's space in your life for you to do that graciously. And also to give other people the space in the room to be having that kind of day too. Or to throw yourself at something you really want to have a go at with all the energy that you've got, just not too bothered about what comes out the other side. Maybe there's a lesson in there for all of us. Of course it matters that we apply ourselves to things. Of course it matters that we do our best at times. Of course it matters that our relationships aren't things that we that we come at, to use Gabby Hinsliff's language, half-assed. Or it's important that we don't just do the minimum. But you know what? We don't have to get everything right. And that's one of the great. That's one of the great joys of the gospel reading the stories of Jesus as he encounters person after person. He, all, he never says to them, have you got it all right? He asks them where their heart lies and what their life is about and what's going on. And he listens and he takes part and the moment becomes meaningful and their lives are transformed because they have nothing to prove. Only, only a, a great openness to, to have unfurl inside them towards, towards love and grace and God. I hope that can happen for you too, if you need that today. Bless you, and I'll be back tomorrow. Cheers.